Good morning. You guys, are, you guys all look refreshed. You slept in a little this morning. No masks. But I nearly thought everyone's rebels this morning, but come on, let's go. We're going to dive straight into the Word this morning. Um, and we're going to be reading from a passage in um, John chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can take that out. Um, and we're going to look at the story of Lazarus this morning. And it starts off like this. I'm going to, I'll actually, I'll tell you how it goes. So there's Jesus and his disciples there out somewhere about doing the work of God, ministering to people, you know, doing all these things. And then there's, in a town close to him, there's people that he loves, Mary and Martha, and they send this. It says, John chapter 11, verse 1, it starts with, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister, Martha. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. You know, in those days, there wasn't cars. So when you wanted to send a no BBM, WhatsApp, you had to like send somebody, you know, to go fetch, send a message. Crazy days. When Anna's old and she complains about fetching someone, I just remind her in those days. But let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that this morning we get to take from your word, God, and get to see more of who you are, Jesus. I pray that you will soften our hearts this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, and that you will, uh, you will bless my mouth, God, that what I speak will be from your heart, God, and it will go pierce the hearts of those that need to hear it. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say, amen. Amen. Cool. So this morning, I want to preach on a message called, What If It's Too Late? What if it is too late? The story continues and it goes on. On his arrival, so Jesus hears the message. To give you context, he hears you know, these people are ill, so after he receives a message, the Bible says he continues his work for another two days. And then only he says to his disciples, guys, let's go to Bethany. We've got some business to take care of. Then the story continues. Yeah, it says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Wow. For four days. Do you ever feel that like you're in distress and you really need Jesus right now and God, can you please just, yes, can you help me? It's like when I'm driving with my car and I see the petrol light comes on. I say, Jesus, please help me get home. And then as I came up the hill in Donna Bay, the engine decided the petrol's done and my car died. And I was like, where were you, God? Really? I asked for help. Where were you? Do you ever feel like that? Only me? Only me? All right. See, it's only me. But it's cool. The story goes on. It says, and many, um, for four days, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Do you ever feel like you get to places where you say, Jesus, if you were just, yeah, I would not be sitting where I'm sitting if you just showed up earlier? Do you ever feel like that? On my off day, one day I was hungry. No surprise. I'm always... I, I think when Jesus made me, he left a hole in my stomach somewhere because... But I was hungry and I'm a two-minute noodle guy. I'm waiting to get the Grammys for the most two minute noodles eaten, world record. But I go, I open the cupboard, the noodles are finished. I'm like, what am I going to do? I open the deep freeze, there's pies. Next best thing, you know. Pepper steak pie, oh, come on, I take it out, it's frozen. I'm like, what? I look, I put it in the oven, I read the instructions, put the oven on 150 for 30 minutes. 30 minutes? I'm like, I'm going to be dead by then. By the time this pie is done, I'm going to be starved. Yes, we're going to need Jesus to come visit Mossel Bay. So I thought, you know what? I was in school. I got mad. I'll just half the time and double the temperature. That makes perfect sense. 150 degrees, 30 minutes. 300 degrees, 15 minutes. Why do people not think about this? I put it in. I put my oven on that little timer. Sometimes I think that timer is wonky because, yeah. Forever. But I put it on, I go about my day, I make coffee, I, you know, I do my stuff, and I hear, yeah, 
by the time I go over to the oven, I open up, it is like a black cloud of like smoke that comes out of the oven. It was crazy. I'm like, what's going on here? I take out the pie and it is burnt. Black. Burnt black. Guys, I still had hope, you know. I'm hopeful. I take out the butter knife. You know when you burn your toast, you scrape that black <laughs> burnt off, but you eat that piece of toast. I take out that pie. Yes, and I start scraping because I'm hungry. But the more I scrape, the smaller the pie becomes. You know, it's like decreasing in size. And I'm like, what's happening? Eventually, all the burnt black is off. But now, I'm sitting with half a raw pie and half a pie, you know. And the same thing happens when we try to rush the process of God. When we try to rush the timing of God, we end up burning ourselves, not having enough, and only getting half of the blessing God has for us, half of the plan and purpose He has for our lives. And so this goes on. Jesus hears that Lazarus is dying. He is ill, but He takes His time. He takes His time to show up. This morning, I want to encourage and remind you, if you are sitting here this morning and you feel like, where are you, Jesus? I have been asking you for a miracle in my parents' life. I have been asking you for healing me from this illness. I have been asking for you, but where are you? I want to encourage you and remind you that there is a purpose in the delay. God has a plan and a purpose within your delay today. He wants to glorify His name, and He wants to grow you and show you and take you places you have never been. He doesn't want you to have a burnt pie. But we've got to trust God. The Bible says it like this. In Psalm 100, no, Psalm 27, it says this. It says, here's what I've learned through it all. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Jesus gave me this verse a little bit earlier. I would have had a whole pie. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave and courageous. And never lose hope. Yes. Keep on waiting. Keep on waiting. I believe that is for someone this morning. Keep on waiting. God is working a miracle in your life. If Jesus didn't come four days late to Lazarus, to the town of Bethany, there would be no miracle. God is working a miracle in your life. Don't lose hope. For He will never disappoint you. Come on, that's awesome. God will never disappoint you. Wow. My wife wishes I would say that to her. But we know Jesus has a back. The story continues and it goes like this. It says, Jesus said to her, no, Jesus and Martha, they're having conversation. He says, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You know when you're trying to explain something to somebody and they say they understand, but you know they don't understand. I feel like this is what is happening. Yeah, there was like, you know. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. You see, we have two things going down here at this moment outside of Bethany. The first thing is this. Jesus is trying to let Martha understand that the resurrection is not an event. So often we walk around looking for an opportunity, looking for a position, because if we can get a better job, I'll be happy. If I can get a better girlfriend, I'll be happy. If I can get more money, I'll be happy. If I can get one more good opportunity, things will change. We keep walking around looking for an opportunity, looking for an event to resurrect something that's dying within us. But Jesus wants Martha to understand that it is not, the resurrection is not an event, but it is a person. It is Jesus. He is the resurrection. Not something that happens. He is it. He's trying for her to understand this. But now there's also this, Two sides to the story. He's explaining, look, your brother's not dead. He's going to rise again. But she's like, no, she understands. She really is not understanding what Jesus is saying. There is two types of perspective that we are looking at here. We are looking at Martha, which believes in God, and she knows that Jesus is the resurrection. But we've got Jesus that says, if you will just understand what I'm saying, today I want to resurrect something in your life. So often we get up and we read our Bibles and we say we believe in God, we trust God, but we don't live it. 
We don't walk in line with God's Word and in step with His Spirit to see the glory of God today. The word perspective comes from the original translation in Greek, and it splits up in two. Per, which means through, and spesa. Guys, if someone's Greece, yeah, and speaks Greek, guys, don't judge. I think that's how you pronounce it. I did listen to it on Google Voice. You know where you listen to that little speaker? But it means to look. So perspective means to look through something. So often we look at perspective at something. What is my perspective on something? My perspective on is determined by the facts, what I'm seeing in front of me. But when we look through something, we see something different. When we look through the Word of God, we see God's perspective. The psalmist puts it like this in Psalm 119. He says that, I have buried your word within my heart. The Bible says that we should guard our hearts for everything we do flows from within. If we bury the word of God within our hearts, whatever we see will come from the heart of God and we will see our situations through the eyes of Jesus. Church, I want to encourage you this morning, where are you looking from? Where is your perspective coming from? Are you seeing half a full glass, half an empty glass? Where is your perspective coming from? Because there is power in perspective. When we see things from the heart of Jesus, when we see things through Christ, there is power in this perspective. There is resurrection in seeing things from God's heart. The story goes on and it says, Where Jesus is moved by compassion, and now Martha goes home and she fetches Mary. She says, the Lord is looking for you. And she comes and she says the same thing. Yes, God, if you were just a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, my brother would not have died. And Jesus is moved by compassion and he's moved by what's going on. And he says, all right, where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? If Jesus had to come here right now and say, where are you laying the things that need resurrection in your life? Would you take him there? Are you taking Jesus to the pains and the hurt and the disappointment? Or are you hiding it away in a cave? You're saying, God, it's fine. Deal with all of these other people, but me, I'm good. Will you take Jesus to the cave? Will you take him there? So they decided, you know, we'll take Jesus there. And they take Jesus and they go to this, this cave. And the story goes like this. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Jesus said, take away the stone. But, take away the stone. But Martha, she was like, no, 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 whoa, whoa, hold up. You know when we say, Jesus, could you come and help me? In my finances, <laughs> this is a true story, do you have my finances? And then you drive past McDonald's. Or someone comes up on a Sunday and they're like, we've got to give into the kingdom of God first. And you're like, whoa, 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 hold up. We can't open this tomb. We can't open this because the body by now is probably stinking. It has an odor. Doctors say that by now the body should have already started decomposing. No, no. So we ask God, God, could you come? Could you do something in my life? Use me, please. But <laughs> don't open up the tomb. Keep it closed. A few, a year and a half, nearly two years ago, I got out the shower. Yes, so I like showering, so I got out. Lazan was watching TV. I went and laid on the bed, and I was reading. And then Lazan's like, hey, Michael, come watch TV with me. The Temptations of Netflix. I want to be a good husband, so I put down the book. He's like, I'll read later. Get up, I go to the lounge. But when I get up, I had like a... Pins and needles in my foot, you know? You know when you sit funky and then next minute you like walk and people think you're a gangster, but you actually your foot's got no pins and needles. Yes, and I like walked in and Lazan looked at me funny and I went and I sat down and I was like, what's up? I sat there. But then the next moment, it's almost like someone found a bucket full of pins and needles and they like threw me with it because the next thing, like my knees had pins and needles. Maybe they had pins and needles in your knees. It's not good. My top legs, my hips, then my stomach was like pins and needles. I was like, what's going on here? My chest, my arms, my fingers, my eyelids. 
my mouth, it was like everywhere you can think, I'm so sure my teeth had pins and needles. I just, I was like, I'm gonna die. Like this is it, like I'm having a stroke, it's game over, I, you know, don't guys, please. If I can give you one tip of advice, never Google your symptoms. <laughs> it never ends well. I Google, I'm having a stroke, I'm like, it's over, get a pay, I gotta write a will. It's over. Lazan's like, we should get her to the doctor. I'm like, no, they can't save me anymore. It's over, let it be. I go, I laid on my bed and I was like, stressed out, like this is it, you know. It's game over and eventually it passes. And I was like, phew. And I missed it. I was like walking around telling people, guys, I survived it. I made it. Next week, yes, I wake up around midnight and there's pins and needles in my legs. And I'm like, oh, yes, not again. And I get up and I try to put the light on, but when I go for the light, I miss the light switch completely. And guys, I got good aim. So I knew this was wrong because when I try to put the light on, I hit like the door next door with this. I was like, what's going on? I tried to wake Lazana, but my voice wasn't working so like, and my tongue was like lame. Like I couldn't speak and I was trying to like push her, but I had no strength in my arms. I was like, I'm gonna die again. <laughs> this is it, it's game over. Eventually I woke her up and she's like, this is not good. I didn't Google my symptoms this time because I couldn't get the phone to type. <laughs> but I was like, she took me to the hospital. I was like, it's fine, don't worry, we have kids. You've got to stay with the kids. You know, it's gonna be all right. I'll take this one on myself. I'll be the man, I'll drive. I don't even know, guys, that's the worst advice I've ever had given myself. I got in the car, I drove, it's like three in the morning, I'm phoning my dad, I'm like, I'm gonna die, and I'm crying, and my dad's like, just calm down, why are you driving, phone the ambulance, I'm like, no. Stop at the hospital, and I like walk in, and people don't feel my pain, like people are so calm there. I eventually get in, I'm sitting, I'm waiting for the doctor, because they have to come now from home, and while I'm sitting there, there comes an acquaintance I have, they're not my friends, they don't, come to church, I don't even, I don't know if they believe in Jesus. They come by and they're like, whoa, Michael, shocked to see me, they take a seat and I'm like, I'm gonna die, it's over, this is what's going on. This person's like, yo, that's crazy, can I pray for you? And for the first time I realized, through all of these experiences, not once did I go to Jesus. Not once did I say, Lord, please I don't wanna die. What is going on? You see, the story continues, but what happens is when we ask, we believe God, I was reading the Word of God, I was worshiping God, I was trusting God, but my timer is frozen back there. I feel like I've got 17 minutes for the last 10 minutes. Just, um, when I go and I'm like, God, where are you? But I don't want to roll away the stone. Later on, I ended up seeing doctors and they'd done a whole bunch of tests. Guys, needles that night. I think they fetched it out the hosepipe closet. Those were huge things. They stuck it in my hand, not even like behind you, in my hand. But eventually the doctor says, Michael, you're going to make it. You're going to survive. But you're struggling with anxiety. You're struggling with this anxiety. You see, my pride became so big that it became a stone in front of my tomb. That raising kids and being a husband and trying to calculate finances became so much that instead of going to Jesus, I was prideful and I said, I've got this, I'm a man. I can do this. The story goes on. It says, take away the stone. Martha says, no, no, whoa, hold up. Hold up. The body's going to stink. For there will be a bad odor. How often do we call God into our lives and when he shows up, we don't want, we don't want him to help. God says to Martha, Jesus says to Martha, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God today? The word of God is so full of promise, of the promise, of the promise that if we believe in him, if we trust in him, if we bring our burdens to him, he'll take care of it. Could you stand with me as we get ready to close? I want to ask you this question this morning. What are the stones that is blocking you from hearing the words of God? What are the stones in front of your cave that is separating you from God's presence, from God's freedom? Because you see there's two major things that happen in this story. If Martha did not take a step of faith to move that stone, 
Firstly, Martha didn't move that stone. She didn't roll that stone away. She told people to move it. The Bible tells us that there were thousands of, maybe not thousands, but there was a couple of hundred people that had come from nearby towns to mourn with Martha and Mary. But then she said, can we move this stone? If she didn't take that step of faith, number one, God would not have been able to perform the miracle that he did this day with Lazarus. But number two, if it was only Martha, Mary, and Jesus, who was going to move that stone? Because I can promise you Martha wasn't going to be able to move it. Mary, Martha, they weren't going to do it. But they had people with them. Church, you've got to hear what I'm saying this morning. If you want to do this race well, you cannot do it alone. We cannot live alone. We have to live in fellowship with other people. At New Life Church, we believe in doing life together. We have awesome life groups, really good life groups. Don't do this walk on your own. Because there's going to come a day where you need to move a stone, roll a stone away, and you don't want to be alone. Let people help you. Join a group. At the end of the service, we have pamphlets at the back. Grab a pamphlet at our info desk. Sign up. Join a life group today. Or tomorrow. But join one up soon. But you see, there's another story in the Bible. Caught up in Mark 3. And there's Jesus and his disciples there in the synagogues, and it's the Sabbath, and there comes a man in by the back door and he's got a lame arm. The original translation says that the way they described him is he had a hand that was dried out. It was so dead and so small and so finicky by now that it was dried out. In this moment, Jesus notices this man needs healing and he calls him forward. He calls him forward into a room full of so-called religious leaders, he says, come into the center of, the Bible says, in the center of the room. Guys, no matter what you do, no matter what your sin looks like, your shame, your guilt, no matter what you are feeling, nothing disqualifies us from the longing God has to have a relationship with you this morning. No sin, no anger, no anxiety, no shame. God wants a relationship with you. He calls this man, takes a bold step, and he walks into the middle of this room, and I'm sure this man was so scared, so afraid. And Jesus says, stretch out your arm. <laughs> I would have laughed. I was like, what do you mean? Stretch out my arm doesn't work. Jesus, my marriage is failing. My job circumstances sucks. How should I go in there positive? But Jesus says, stretch out your arm. And I believe that this morning Jesus is calling us to stretch out the things in our lives that is stopping us from experiencing the fullness of God. Experiencing the fullness of Jesus. So that God can work in your life, He can work in you, through you, and with you. Could you close your eyes? I would love to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're in this room and you're feeling a lot like I feel very often, like, God, where is the delay? Why are you taking so long? Could you just show up? Maybe you're struggling with the perspective. Going to work situations that is difficult and coming home to family where it's tight and it's hard and it's finances is difficult and the siblings are crying and kids and I'm tired and Jesus, could you change my perspective? Could you give me positive thinking? Maybe you're standing here this morning and you know you're struggling. God, there's this addiction in my heart and I just can't kick it. Maybe there's a tomb and a tomb and in front of it there is a stone. And this morning you want Jesus to come and help you move that stone so that you can experience the fullness of God. Or maybe you've never stretched out your arm. You've never taken that bold step to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to try this thing and I'm going to put my hand out so that you can be my Lord and my Savior. I want to pray with you this morning. Nothing weird. You don't have to come forward just where you are in your seats. If you are here this morning and you want to give your heart to Jesus for the very first time, or maybe you want to come back into relationship and commute with God, or maybe you really need a stone to roll and God give me the strength if that's you, I want to pray with you this morning. So I'm going to count to three. And on three, if that is you, you can just pop up your hand. It's just for me to see I want to know who I'm praying with. So one, two, three. I see your hands up front. I see your hands back there. Amen, amen. 
Dear Lord Jesus, you can pray with me in your hearts. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that you are the resurrection and the light and the life, God. God, I pray this morning that I know it's so difficult to wait on your delay, God, but could you give us the endurance and the courage and the strength, God, that we know that you are working a miracle, God. God, could you come and give us a different perspective, God, in our marriage, in our in our relationships, in our jobs, God, on our lives, God, on our value, Jesus. Could you let us see who we are in your eyes, God, not what the world puts on us. God, there's stones in front of us, dear Lord Jesus. Could you come and help us move these stones of pride and unforgiveness and bitterness and resentfulness, God? Could you come and help us, Jesus? But God, could you come and be the Lord and the Savior of our lives? Could you be the one that we serve until we leave this earth? God, we love you. God, we thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody says, Amen.